The last group of fallacies that we're going to take a look at are fallacies of presumption, ambiguity, and grammatical analogy. And we're going to begin by looking at fallacies of presumption. And an argument that commits a fallacy of presumption is defective insofar as its premise or premises presumes the truth of that which the argument purports to prove true. So what's fallacious about this is you're trying to prove that thing to be true, so it's not okay for you to go ahead and assume it to be true. So let's look at the various ways in which fallacies of presumption can be committed. The first fallacy of presumption we're going to look at is begging the question. And you've probably have heard um, the term begs the question or the phrase begs the question before, uh, but you've, used, you've probably have heard it used wrongly. Um, people will say that begs the question when they mean that raises the question. But begs the question or begging the question is different than raising a question. Rather, the way that somebody is making a case for what's at stake, that is what's at question, is just pleading by restating, uh, in some sense restating or presuming um, what is at stake. And we get a fallacy with begging the question um, only when we're creating the illusion that this presumption, that this inadequate um, premise is actually providing adequate support. So if you're being astute, you should, leave, you should still be asking yourself, well, how do you know that? Um, how, what support have you really given me for that position that's supposed to suggest that it's true? So here's an example in um, comic form. So this person says, finding love is really easy. You just have to be yourself. So if you love yourself, I'm sorry, if you just are yourself, if you're just being yourself, you'll find love. Um, that's this person's position. Is that so, Einstein? Well, I've been myself for as long as I can think of, and where's my true love now, you dimwit? So he's, preside, he's giving himself as a, as a um, counter example. Well, I'm myself, and I haven't gotten true love yet. And this person says, tis tis. If you haven't found it yet, it just goes to show you never really were yourself anyway. So again, he's, just all, he's continuing to assume his position that, um, that if you are yourself, you'll find true love. And if we continue assuming that position, then he's going to just draw the conclusion, well, it just must be that you never were yourself. And as this person points out, that's circular reasoning, which is a kind of begging the question. He's just going around in a circle. He says, no, I've refuted that concept years ago. Begging the question comes in three forms. And we'll look at concrete examples of these forms, but at the moment, let's take a look at them in the abstract. So our first form, what takes place is our author supplies, us, supplies um, the listener's premises, but they leave out a background assumption. They leave out uh, uh, an implicit premise that they must be accepting in order to get to the conclusion. That is, they're presuming it, but they're not being explicit um, about this presumption. And it would be oftentimes is a questionable premise, one that the audience probably isn't um, likely to accept. And so it's difficult, by, by leaving it out, it makes it difficult for the audience to go, well, wait a second. Um, yeah, those premises are going to get you to the conclusion. That is, if the premises are true, the conclusion is going to have to be true. But this background assumption you got going on here, this, this premise that you're leaving out, that looks like it's false, like I'm not going to accept it. Um, and by leaving it out, you don't give the listener the opportunity or you make it much more difficult for the listener to do that. And um, people can be misled into thinking that the argument's actually good because they can't identify the false premise in it. Our next form, what we do, what somebody does, is they take a premise that is questionable 
And then their conclusion is just a restatement of that premise. It's just done with uh, different language. Um, so it's, it's uh, conveying the same content. It means the same thing. But it looks different, and because of the premise and the conclusion look like they're different, like they're because they're using different words, um, we sometimes fail to see that really they're expressing the same thing. So, and if you really are just expressing the same thing, then the premise, is, since it's also the conclusion, you're just presuming the conclusion to be true by offering the premise. But the premise as well as the conclusion, since they're saying the same thing, is what you need to be giving support for. It's what you need to be arguing for. The last form, number three, is our circular reasoning. So you start with um, a premise that is shaky, or one that is in question, and then you derive or you make an inference from it. You make another inference and another inference, and then that last inference however long it is, goes back to, to prove the original premise to be true. So it, it just goes around in this circle. But <clears throat> the question for us to accept those inferences, we needed for the premise that we began with to be true. We need to already be ready to accept that. Um, and if the logic just is going to circle back to it, um, it's it's just you're supporting a castle in the sky as it were so uh, it ends up being circular and and um, not persuasive and the way that we get fooled by this type of begging the question is if the inferences between the original premise and the conclusions are long enough we forget or at least don't identify that we are engaging in circular reasoning and then um, if we can't identify that, then we, we get fooled and we might accept the argument being given to us. Now let's look at begging the question using concrete examples. Above we have the argument murder is morally wrong, therefore abortion is morally wrong. Now to get from the first premise to the conclusion um, at validly, as a valid argument, that is, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true, we need an additional premise, namely that abortion is a form of murder, that abortion is murder. By leaving that out, it makes it difficult for us to see what we might disagree, um, what we might disagree with, because everybody's going to agree that murder is morally wrong. And so that might trick you into accepting the conclusion without um, thinking about thinking harder about whether you agree with abortion being murder, and of course that's what's at contention in the first place between pro-lifers and pro-choicers: is abortion a form of murder? Is it a form of wrongful killing? Um, and that then is what needs to be argued for. That's really the question that's at stake here. Our next argument says that capital punishment is justified for the crimes of murder and kidnapping because it is quite legitimate and appropriate that someone be put to death for having committed such hateful and inhuman acts. What's going on here, if we think about the relation between the two clauses, the two statements that come before the word because, or the one that comes before it and then one that comes after it, they're basically saying the same thing, just using different words, which means that we're not getting, if they are the same thing, if they mean the same thing, we're not being given any outside information for thinking that it's true that capital punishment is justified for the crimes of murder and kidnapping. So let's look at why, uh, why we should think that they're basically saying the same thing. Capital punishment just involves putting somebody to death. And maintaining that it's justified. It's pretty much the same as saying 
it is quite legitimate and appropriate. And then the crimes of murder and kidnapping are such hateful and inhuman acts. And so <clears throat> now we see that really what we're trying to support the, our conclusion with is really just a restatement of that conclusion. So the premise and the conclusion are just saying the same thing. Um, and that should be as convincing to you as somebody saying, well, well, you know why God exists, how I know God exists, because God exists. Only what's taking place here is by using different words, it doesn't seem like we're being given the same exact same information. And so we can get fooled into accepting it as a good argument. All right, in our last case, uh, it says the Book of Mormon is true because it was written by Joseph Smith. So our conclusion is that the Book of Mormon is true. It's written by Joseph Smith. Well, how, <clears throat> um, why should Joseph Smith writing it tell me that the Book of Mormon is true? Well, jo Joseph Smith wrote the truth because he was divinely inspired. Well, how do I know that? Because the Book of Mormon said it was, said that Joseph Smith was divinely inspired and the Book of Mormon is true. Well, notice that our conclusion and the last bit of reasoning that we have really are the same thing. So at the end of the day, even though I've, we, in this argument, there's a whole lot of middle stuff going in between them. At the end of the day, we're saying that the Book of Mormon is true because the Book of Mormon is true. And this type, so this is circular reasoning and um, we get confused by circular reasoning or we'll accept it as a, being a, a piece of, um, or as an example of a good argument when it's really spread out. Um, there's a lot of middle stuff going on that obscures or makes it harder to identify or makes us forget that um, really our conclusion and our last little bit of evidence are the same, or at least that we've used some bit of the evidence in between there that was that was the same. And that's how we get confused on that. Because again, if, if someone said to you, the Book of Mormon is true because the Book of Mormon is true, you would, even though that's clearly a valid argument, if the premise is true, the conclusion has to be true, um, you're not going to find it a, to be a very persuasive argument. I mean, um, I could, if that is, I could persuade you to anything, right, of anything. So it's only by putting all this connections in between that we get um, confused into thinking that maybe we have a good argument. Our next um, fallacy of presumption is complex question. And when you offer a complex question, um, there's multiple questions that are built into it, but it takes the form as if there were just one question being asked. So if there's multiple questions going on, um, then one answer is going to commit somebody to something that they might not want to commit to. So to get around complex question, you need to be astute enough to break up the question in, into its constituent parts. So we can see an example here, a loaded question. So sometimes this is called loaded question. Um, we have one monkey saying to the other, do you know that your political views are destructive to this country? So notice that what's built into this question um, is that, is that uh, the political views are destructive to the country. So it doesn't matter which way you answer. If the, if the other monkey answers no, then they've 
assented to um, the political views being destructive to the country. And if they say yes, then they've also have um, committed themselves to their political views being destructive to the country. So the only way out of it is to be able to break up these questions or be able to point out that, that hey, you're already presuming something about me or about my views in asking that question. So the monkey thinks um, to herself, well, why do I feel like I've been set up? Whether I answer yes or no, I'm conceding that my political views are destructive to this country. The next, all right, our next fallacy, kind of fallacy is false dichotomy. And in a false dichotomy, what happens is we're presented um, two alternatives when there's actually more than just two alternatives available to us. So uh, here we have the cashier saying, do you want to donate $15 to feed starving children or do you hate children? So the person is maintaining that there's only two options. You donate 15 bucks or you hate children. But maybe there's multiple options in between there. Maybe donating less than $5, maybe liking children even though you don't have the money to donate, um, etc. right? So by um, presuming that there's only these two options, we, uh, we try to trap people into thinking that there's, um, that there are only these two options. And then by making one of them a, a terrible option, trying to get them to accept the alternative, which in this case would be to, to, to donate $15 to feed starving children. <clears throat> Suppressed evidence. Um, so in this fallacy, um, what's going on, if you'll remember, we needed to meet the total evidence requirement. So if somebody knows certain information but is leaving it out, then um, and then gives an inductive argument and says, "Well, look, this argument is strong," and the art and the information that was left out is pertinent to whether the conclusion follows probably or not. Then you're suppressing the evidence and you're um, engaging in this fallacy. So the comic I have down here is about the best I could do for this fallacy. We have um, Hagar, the terrible telling his buddy here, I think I'll buy a drink for everybody in the bar. Now, if you imagine that uh, we, we could supply the conclusion or him saying that because I'm going to buy a drink for everybody in the bar, I'm a genuine and I am a very generous person. And um, we see that he's leaving out the important evidence that they are the only two people at the bar, then we, you know, by leaving out that evidence, we might not accept the conclusion that he would like us to draw here. All right, let's look at some more fallacies. All right, so let's determine which fallacy, which of our fallacies of pre presumption is being committed here. So our first um, sentence says, Bob, are you still beating your wife? Take a little bit of time and decide what fallacy you think is committed. If you said complex question, good. Because built into this question is the presumption that Bob is beating his wife. So no matter whether Bob says yes or no, he ends up committing himself to beating his wife when perhaps he hasn't at all. All right, and our next one, it says, either you buy me a new Rolex watch or I'll be late for all of my meetings. Because being late would be a bad thing, the conclusion seems clear. You should buy me the Rolex. So consider this for a moment and decide which of our fallacies of presumption is being committed. If you said false dichotomy, good. Um, here we're presented only two all alternatives. You buy the very expensive Rolex watch or this person is going to be late to all of her meetings. But um, 
you know, there's other ways to not be late for all of the meetings, which would be bad. Namely, I could get you the cheapo watch from wherever, um, and it's opposed to the Rolex watch. All right, so let's look at the last one. Of course, Chinese green tea is good for your health. If it weren't, then how could it be so beneficial to drink it? So think about this one for a little bit. The fallacy that's being committed here is begging the question. So really, the rhetorical question that we're given at the end of it, how could it be so beneficial to drink it, um, is asserting that it is beneficial to drink it. But notice that that's just pretty much the same to say that it's green tea is good for your health. So really, we just have a restatement of the conclusion. So that meets one of our forms of begging the question. Right, let's look at a couple more examples and identify the fallacy that's occurring. So in the first one, why did you lie on the witness stand? If you maintain that that is a complex question, good. And it's a complex question because if you just simply answer it as a yes or a no, then you will have committed yourself to lying on the witness stand. To get out of this fallacy, you need to back up and say, well, look, I, I didn't lie on the witness stand. That's not what happened. All right, in our next uh, example, we have good reason to believe that no one will be cured of Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. In the next 200 years, namely, no one has been cured of ALS in the past 200 years. So think about this and decide which fallacy you think is occurring. The fallacy occurring here is suppressed evidence. So without the evidence that's being suppressed, it's a strong argument, right? If, if it's true that no one in the past 200 years has been cured of ALS, that's a fairly good reason that, uh, well, maybe not in the next 200 years, but at least in the relatively near future that no one's going to be cured of ALS. But if we supply the evidence that we didn't know about Lou Gehrig's disease until only 50 years ago or so, and if we also uh, leave out the, the um, important evidence that we've made great strides in, in medicine and in genetics and things of that sort, um, then our conclusion is much weaker, right, if we include that. And, so, and uh, for that reason, it commits the suppressed evidence fallacy. Now we're going to take a look at fallacies of ambiguity. And an argument that commits a fallacy of ambiguity is defective insofar as there is ambiguity in the argument's premises, conclusion, or both. Especially when it, uh, the person, because of that ambiguity, um, ends up concluding the wrong conclusion, making the wrong inference or at least the probably wrong inference. So let's um, look at the couple of kinds of fallacies of ambiguity that's available. There's two ways to have a fallacy of ambiguity. One of them is equivocation, and this is when the conclusion of the argument, that is, in order to, um, in order to get it to follow, depends on the fact that a word or phrase is used in two different senses. So, you know, sometimes we um, have words that have more than one meaning. And then if we trade those meanings, because the word is the same, it can look like a conclusion logically follows when, in fact, it doesn't because we're really using two different senses of the word. The example I have here, hey, you can't just take that. It's, a, it's stealing. 
Our robber here says, so what? They steal in baseball all the time. If it's okay for baseball players to steal, logically it's okay for me to steal too. And our sword owner uh, scratches his head and says, well, you have a point. And the robber says that was easy. Of course, to get to the robber's conclusion, um, we have to uh, miss that the word steal or stealing has two different senses. One, the, the case in baseball is much different than the case of taking somebody's property. So when it trades on just one word or a small phrase, that's equivocation. But if the grammatical structure of the sentence allows for two different readings of the sentence, then what we're committing is amphibole. So as it says here, when the arguer misinterprets an ambiguous statement and draws a conclusion from that misinterpretation. So the signs, um, as an example, customers who think our waiters are rude should see the manager. The strong reading of that is that customers um, that think that their waiters are rude should see the manager to have that rudeness taken care of in one way or the other. But there is another reading um, because of its grammatical structure, which is that customers who think our waiters are rude, wait till you get a load of the manager. That person's really rude. Um, and because there's these two ways of reading the entire statement, two ways, um, two distinct meanings that are associated with the entire statement, that's when you have amphiboly. With equivocation, it's just one word like steal or maybe a phrase, maybe a phrase. All right, let's look at some uh, cases when a fallacy has been committed and try to determine whether we have a case of equivocation or whether we have a case of amphiboly. So in our first argument, it says whatever is bright is intelligent. The sun is extremely bright, so the sun is extremely intelligent. So think about that for a moment and then determine whether you think it's equivocation or amphiboly. If you said equivocation, good. What's taking place is there are two meanings that are associated with the word bright. Um, one is intelligent or smart, but the other one has to do with um, a whole lot of light. And when we say the sun is extremely bright, that's only true if what we mean is um, the sun gives off a whole lot of light. It's only if we equivocate between the two meanings of the word bright does it seem to follow that the sun is extremely intelligent. So we're equivocating between the word bright and that's the fallacy that is taking place. So now let's take a look at this um, passage below. It says, Jason said he heard the, the Campanile's bells stumbling home from the bars. I guess the Campanile bells must like to go bar hopping. So think about that for a moment and determine whether you think amphiboly is taking place or equivocation. So you said that amphiboly that is correct. The strong reading of this statement is that Jason heard the Campanile's bells while Jason was stumbling home from the bars. But because of the grammatical, in this case, very poor grammatical structure, another way of reading this is Jason said he heard the Campanile's bells while the Campanile bells were stumbling home from the bars. And if we pick that reading, then we can infer that the Campanile Bells must like to go bar hopping, but we probably picked the wrong interpretation. And so it's, our inference is fallacious. Let's look at a couple more examples. Sugar is a key material in numerous metabolic processes. In light of this, 
Sugar is an essential component of the body. What this means is that we ought to be sure to consume sugary foods like candy and sugary drinks like pop. Decide whether you think this is a case of equivocation or a case of ambivalent. You maintain that it is equivocation, good. What's going on here is that the sugar um, in our metabolic processes involves glucose, but the sugar that is in drinks and pop, and um, I'm sorry, drinks like pop and in candy is sucrose. And since those aren't the same things, it doesn't follow that because we need to have glucose that we should um, consume sugary foods, that is foods with sucrose, like candy and pop. Now let's look at the bottom statement. Pauline said that after she had removed her new mink coat from the shipping container, she threw it in the trash. Conclusion, Pauline has no appreciation for fine furs. So think about this for a moment and decide whether um, whether equivocation is taking place or whether amphiboly is taking place. If you said amphiboly, good. When Paul, there's two ways to read this first statement. One is that Pauline, after removing her new mink coat, threw the mink coat in the trash. In which case, it really would follow that Pauline has no appreciation for fine furs. But that's probably not the correct interpretation. The correct interpretation, or correct reading, is that after removing the new mink coat from the shipping container, she threw the shipping container into the um, trash. So the problem here is that because of the grammatical structure, we don't know what the word it is referring back to. Is it referring back to, or at least it's not obvious. Right? So it's either referring back to a shipping container or to the new mink coat. It's probably the shipping can container that's being referred back to. Now we're going to look at fallacies of grammatical analogies. And arguments that commit a fallacy of grammatical analogy are similar to arguments that have the same linguistic structure and are good. So we're given some arguments. Um, because of the content of the arguments, the conclusion does follow. But when we try to apply that same structure, that same linguistic structure, to other content, it just doesn't fall. So let's look at the kinds of grammatical analogies that um, involve this. All right, so there's going to be two forms that we're going to look at. There's the fallacy of composition and the fallacy of division. And these are similar fallacies, they just run in opposite directions. The fallacy of composition concludes that because the parts of something all have a particular property, then the whole, the thing taken as a whole, will have that property as well. Division, on the other hand, maintains that because the whole has a particular property, the parts are going to have that property. So we can look at this example here. We have this person saying that the statue is made out of um, paper clips and you can't make something beautiful out of paper clips. So the, the underlying reasoning here is no single paper clip is beautiful. So anything made out of those paper clips, it will also not be beautiful. But that doesn't fall. Turns out, um, at least in principle, that you can um, do that. And likewise, so that would be a fallacy of composition. Likewise, if we said because 
the statue is beautiful, then the paper clips that's making up each of the paper clips that's making up the statue is itself beautiful. That will also be fallacious. Um, it, the statue can be beautiful while the paper clips themselves are not beautiful. All right, let's um, decide whether we have the fallacy of composition or the fallacy of division taking place. So our first argument says each of the 10 songs on the CD is between four and five minutes long. Thus the entire contents of the CD itself will play for only four to five minutes. If you maintain that this is the fallacy of composition, good. Because structurally, it's saying that because each song has the property of being between four and five minutes long, then the whole, the thing that's comp composed out of those things, will also only be four to five minutes long. Now let's look at the next one. According to researchers, polar bears are rapidly disappearing. If this is true, it follows that the polar bear that we just saw on that Discovery Channel program must be rapidly disappearing. If you said division, good. First, we're taking the whole of polar bears we're saying that they're rapidly disappearing and going extinct. But from that, it doesn't mean that each of the things that makes up the class of polar bears is each themselves rapidly disappearing. Thus, it is committing the fallacy of division. It's very easy to confuse um, hasty generalizations with compositions, so I want to take a little bit of time to tease out the different components and um, the different structure that these fallacies take. So recall the, the important parts of composition, the fallacy of composition, is we're making a judgment about a whole because each of, its pro each of its parts or components have a particular property. So for instance, an instance has no duration. An hour is just a bunch of instants that are strung together. Therefore, an hour has no duration. So we're saying that because these parts, the instance, have the property of having no duration, that an hour also has the property of having no duration. That's composition. Generalization, on the other hand, is different. In generalization, we take a sample. We're not saying if um, here's a property that all the parts have. We're saying, well, here's a sample in which we noticed that this guy, you know, um, this member has the property, this member has the property, this member has the property. Therefore, each member of the class will also have that property. Each member of the class will also have that property. Not the whole itself, but each member. So here, United Airlines UA flight 863 was late arriving in Houston, then flight 722 was late, and then flight 495 was late. So what this shows is that United Airlines flights are all late these days. So here we took a sample and then said, well, each of the members are going to have the same property of being late. 